Welcome to the CCNA Connecting Network series. This is the fourth in a series of four. Uh, we're doing chapter seven, securing site-to-site -site connectivity. This is the chapter that we focus heavily on VPN technology. So with that said, we're talking about VPNs. We're gonna talk about kind of what a VPN is. We're gonna talk about uh, GRE. And then we're gonna transition into IPsec end with remote access and a summary. So again, the objective is to talk about VPN technologies, understand how they work, understand the purposes and the benefits of them, explain the differences between GRE and IPsec, uh, focus on explaining things like any connect client, uh, remote SSL clients, things of that nature. We're gonna end with a compare IPsec with a SSL remote VPN. So again, without further ado, first portion is VPN. So what is the purpose of a VPN? Essentially, a VPN is used to create end-to-end -end private network connections over a third-party network. Uh, so essentially, end-to-end -end connection through the internet that will allow us to extend corporate resources or uh, land resources and to mimic the LAN through a third-party network. Typically, to implement VPNs, you have to have a gateway. This gateway could be a router, could be a firewall, could be uh, another security appliance. You have to have a point A and a point B, typically. Benefits of VPNs are gonna be things like the cost saving, uh, enable organization to use cost-effective third-party uh, transport solutions when connecting remote offices back to a uh, home base. Uh, it's scalable. The scalability allows organizations to use the internet infrastructure with ISPs to make things easier adding remote locations. Compatibility, normally VPNs don't matter what the underlying layer two technology is. Is it DSL, is it cable, is it satellite? As long as it's stable, label, sorry, as long as it is stable, layer two technologies, it's fine. Lastly is security. It, you can have mechanisms in place to encrypt traffic to and from, that way, uh, you can help protect data from unauthorized access as it goes through that third-party network. So you can connect the entire network to one another. In the past, you used to have to use lease lines. Now, that's being replaced by site-to-site -site VPNs. There's other layer two technologies out there like MPLS and uh, Metro Ethernet, but we're not gonna go that far. Right now, we're focusing on site-to-site -site VPNs but it's a, a way to use the existing infrastructure of the internet to connect remote locations. Internal hosts, they have no knowledge that a VPN exists. Traffic flows seamless between locations. So creating when a device on both sides of the VPN are aware of the VPN configuration. Basically, this allows us to route traffic based off of our addresses. If example, you're a remote user and you want to access the corporate LAN, it would, you'd send a packet, the router, if it's set up correctly, should be able to sense that it's going to the corporate network and it will send it through the tunnel interface through the internet. And then that may or may not be encrypted based off the technology that you're working with. So end, end, end hosts send and receive the traditional TCP traffic uh, through the VPN. It doesn't recognize that there's anything there. Because again, here we're doing, uh, the tunnel is created at the router and is routed through the router. Here is the example of the site-to-site -site VPN. We'll have a laptop going through the internet back to a corporate network. Well, the problem here is this is a site to site, meaning source and destination have to have static addresses. What happens when that's not feasible? 
what happens when you have a mobile workforce and they could be logging in from anywhere? Well, you don't want a site to site between anywhere. That allows us to talk about the next section, which is remote access VPNs. And they're very similar to a site to site VPN, except it's a mobile to site VPN. Your corporate network IP doesn't change, but it does it is configured in such a way to allow incoming VPN connections from different addresses. That way, you could be a mobile worker working at Starbucks, working at home, working at McDonald's, working at Motel 6. It doesn't really matter because you're tunneling into a static address and that is configured to support that tunnel back in. And then again, there's going to be verification processes, making sure that you're authorized and all of that good stuff. So Cisco has the Cisco AnyConnect client, and basically you can configure that with a passphrase or certificate, and that is what allows the connection back to the corporate site, because that corporate site is going to first of all see, are you authorized? Do you have the appropriate security in, uh, measure in place to accept that incoming VPN connection? If you do it via passphrase and the client coming in has the correct passphrase, then yes. If it is based off a certificate, then it will check the certificate. Once the VPN connection is enabled, you may then have to pass credentials like username and password to actually authenticate and authorize you to use those resources. That's one way of doing it. It just kind of depends on which pathway you're taking to do this. So again, here's the visual representation of a mobile or remote access VPN. So we've been talking about site-to-site -site VPNs and one of the big ones is GRE. GRE will encapsulate a layer three packet. GRE is basic, non-secure. It's a tunneling protocol developed by Cisco. It's a nice way to just get introduced to it. It does create a virtual point-to-point -point link to routers at a remote point over an IP network. Within the GRE portion, we have a flag, which will be optional headers, and then we have a protocol type. And basically that way we can select, are we using ethernet, are we using, um, what layer of three technology are we using as well? GRE is identified as a IETF task force standard, IP protocol 47. GRE encap uh, encapsulates using the prot uh, protocol type field. GRE headers to support the encapsulation of any layer three protocol. It's stateless. It doesn't do any type of flow control. GRE does not include any strong security mechanisms. That's important. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. The GRE header together with the tunneling IP header creates at least 24 bytes of additional overhead because it has to be able to tunnel that packet because the GRE header replaces the traditional IP header because it will encapsulate that header in the tunnel header, hence the IP and GRE portion of that. Here is the configuration. If we're doing R1, we'll set up a interface tunnel. You tell it what mode we're doing, tunnel mode GRE IP. You'll actually give it the IP address for our end of the tunnel. Basically here it's going to be a gateway address. So when we want to send it to our remote location, send to this tunnel IP address. You'll have a tunnel source and tunnel destination. And that's all you need for the tunnel for one side. You have to do both sides to get it to come up. Here we're going to also make sure that OSPF is also working in C, router OSPF1, and the network statements. Don't forget you would have to do R2 for this tunnel to come up. Tunnel mode GRE IP specifies as GRE tunnel mode as the tunnel interface mode. Tunnel source, tunnel destination, 
that specifies one uh, side of the tunnel. The IP address specifies the IP address of the tunnel's interface. GRE tunnel verification, you could do a show IP interface brief. You could do a show IP OSPF, uh, show IP OSPF neighbor, assuming that we're using OSPF. But again, GRE does not do encryption or it doesn't have any strong mechanisms for security, so that is a concern. Hence, IPsec. All right, so with IPsec, again, it's very similar to GRE. Uh, forms a virtual network instead of, of using a dedicated layer two connection. It does this to remain private. It can encrypt traffic. It defines how the VPN can be configured in a very secure manner, not bound to any specific encryption or algorithms. Uh, the nice thing here is it does also include things like authentication. Uh, all implementation of IPsec have a plain layer three header, so there's no uh, issues with routing. Functions over all layer two protocols. IP characteristics, it's a framework for open standard that is independent for algorithms, provides data confidentiality, integrity, and authentication, also availability. IPsec acts as the network layer protecting and authenticating IP packets. Confidentiality will be the encryption, integrity it will be the verification uh, that packets aren't tampered with, authentication is verifying the identity. It does this through a internet key exchange, Ike. Anti-replay protection, protects and rejects replayed packets. Basically, this helps prevent spoofing. It does, again, look for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Part of the uh, integrity is also authentication. So confidentiality, it makes sure that when you're sending something, it is encrypted with a key and is decrypted with a key. Now, those keys can be done two different ways, symmetric or asymmetric. Symmetric means the same key does both. Examples could be DES, triple DES, AES, things like that. The encryption and decryption key are the same key. Where with asymmetric, you have an encryption key and a decryption key. An example of that would be RSA. Uh, you normally found in like certificates, but this public and private key combo requires more infrastructure. So how do we get keys to be exchanged? We actually have a Duffy Hellman group that helps the key exchange. It is not an encryption mechanism and it is not typically used to encrypt data. DH is a method to securely exchange the keys that will encrypt data. DH algorithms allow two parties to establish a shared key uh, using an encryption and hashing algorithm. DH is part of IPsec. DH specifies a public key exchange method that provides a way for two peers to establish a shared key secret. Here we have a key exchange, a decryption and encryption key. Both peers need to establish a shared key securely. Here, this is typically symmetric with the same key for both or asymmetric, which will have an encryption and decryption key. Integrity using hash values. Basically integrity is verifying that the packet was not manipulated or changed in transit. Here's an example. The original Jeremy paid $100 and it's sent to the bank as pay Alex $1,000. That has been modified. SHA and MD5 are the two big hashing algorithms out there. But we have a hash based message authentication code, HMAC, and this is a mechanism for message authentication using hash functions. HVAC has two parameters, a message input and a secret key known only to the messenger 
and the intended receiver. Basically, the message sender uses the HMAC function to produce a value that will then be formed by sending it out. The message authentication code is sent along with the message, and then the end node should be able to take both pieces and decrypt the message. Again, common HMAC algorithms, common hash algorithms are MD5 and typically SHA-1. IPsec authentication does have a way to authenticate both sides of the tunnel. We can do this two different ways. Through a pre-shared key, this is a secret key shared between both parties. This could also be symmetric key. And then RSA signatures. This is a digital certificate as exchanged to authenticate peers. Normally, depending on what I'm doing, I've done both. Uh, though RSA signatures, certificates do require more maintenance because you have to verify that the certificates are still valid. Protocol framework, so we can actually, using IPsec, encapsulate the header or the payload or both. So we can do authenticate and he a header, AH. This is the appropriate protocol to use when confidentiality is not required or permitted. Provides data authentication and integrity to the IP packet. Does not provide data confidentiality or encryption of the packet. Encapsulation or the secure payload, ESP, focuses on the payload, not the header. So if we're doing AH, everything's in plain text. If we're doing ESP, the data is encrypted. Protocol framework, a combination of the ESP and AH, or ESP or ESP plus AH, kind of depends on what we're going for. Confidentiality normally is going to be done with ESP. Integrity is again, we're verifying that nothing is altered in transit, MD5 or SHA are going to be our hashing algorithms. Hashing algorithms. Authentication is again verifying each end before it actually builds up. DH algorithm group represents how a shared key will be established between both peers. Here's our framework and our optional choices. Last section, remote access. We have focused heavily on GRE and IPsec, but what happens when we want to deal with a remote access VPN, typically called an SSL VPN? Both types of VPN methods are based on the access requirements of the user and the organization, so do keep that in mind. Both offer access to the VPN, but kind of different ways. The Cisco SSL VPN, also known as a remote VPN, provides your access by using a web browser and the web browser's native SSL encryption. They can provide remote access using the Cisco AnyConnect secure client software. Basically, this is not a site-to-site, -site, this is more of a mobile-to-site VPN. Cisco AnyConnect does have other types of VPN, remote VPN connections. It just kind of depends on what solution you want to go with and kind of what the flavor of the year is. IPsec remote access is again Cisco's easy VPN build an IPsec tunnel. Very similar to a remote access VPN, but here we're calling this a IPsec remote access VPN, not a SSL remote access VPN, because there's more things that have to be enabled. Easy VPN server, normally done on a router or a edge device, firewall or ASA. Then you have the easy VPN remote client, and that allows the actual connection. Here again, VPN server and the remote connection. Lastly, we need to look at how our remote clients compare to one another, SSL versus IPsec. SSL is done through the web, IPsec, encrypts all IP-based applications. Encryption can be moderate or strong for both. Authentication can be moderate or strong to both. Connectivity complex. SSL is way easier to set up than IPsec, but IPsec does have a little bit stronger security. 
And that's actually the end of this chapter. We talked about different types of VPN technology. We talked about SSL, we talked about VPNs, GRE, IPsec, we talked about pre-shared key, Ike, the DH groups, encryption using symmetric and asymmetric keys, and all of that fun good stuff. That is the end of this chapter. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.